my first episode was after the birth of my youngest son. At that stage, I had a, psycho a psychotic episode, literally five days after he was born. Went to hospital for six weeks and they said it would never happen again. About four or five years later, I had another psychosis, at which point they actually diagnosed bipolar. Each psychotic episode is different with the exception of it being incredibly terrifying. I can hear noises and voices which are not really there and see people and things that are not really there. Since that time, I've been on medication ever since. It was pretty hard to get the medication right and I've, I'm currently up to my third psychiatrist um, and I think it's pretty right now. Each recovery is different and takes a really long time, um, in part because you have to deal with the side effects of the medication. The reason why I am who I am, being a personal trainer, is because it's the only way I can live my life. I have to exercise, it's, and I know how good it is for my brain, for my body, for all of me, and I want to be able to show other people you know, what a difference it makes. And it's, yeah, it's about brain chemistry for me. I'd, I'd start to fall over. I'd try to get on the back of a ute and my legs would just feel like they weren't there anymore. Just excruciating pain in the arms, legs, um, back, shoulders, you know, you, you could pick any body part and uh, the pain was horrendous. And then you'd go to the complete opposite where all of a sudden it felt like there weren't muscles there at all. I dropped into the local medical centre here in uh, Murray Bateman and went to sit with the doctor for 15 minutes, you know, understanding that, you know, they have uh, appointments and things and introduced myself and said, I'm looking for a doctor I can build a partnership with, basically, to try and get to the bottom of what's going on and we chatted for an hour and a half for that first visit. He started to restore my faith in medical practitioners again. We finally got to the bottom of everything with a diagnosis of polymyositis. The worst case scenarios are wheelchairs, bedridden, and uh, things like that. He's put me onto prednisone, which is a steroid. The prednisone has allowed me to, you know, get some sleep back at night and be able to function. The downside of that particular drug in itself um, is, you know, liver and kidney failure and all sorts of nastiness along the way. So I guess what, uh, what we're trying to do is find a balance of what's a safe level of dosage and, um, and where we can go from there. Our son has a very rare genetic condition and with that very complicated, uh, complex medical needs, he's kind of one of seven in the world as we understand it. Maxi came along, he has exactly the same thing, but he also has biliocardial facial syndrome on top. So that really makes Maxi the only one in the world and quite a complex little, little kid. There was a chance that it was a um, predisposition genetic condition. And as we found out, I'm a carrier, I don't have it myself, but when it comes to having the boys, then it was, was passed on. We have a medical team that covers us from head to toe, you name it, they're on our team. Some of our doctors pretty much will tell us now they gave up, they would have given up on Maxi. They did not expect him to last longer than probably 12 months. Yeah, we, we did lose Maxi mm. three times in that first 12 months of his life. And uh, yeah, he just, he just is meant to be here. Mm. But uh, yeah, he is a little medical miracle. We have feeding issues, we have displacement of epiglottises, we have slow, slow, slow um, guts, we have really, Max has severe reflux. Um, so yeah, pretty much um, the boys are on quite a cocktail of medicines. It takes quite a long time for us to put the boys' medications together. We have a list and we sort of check it off. Um, we do kidney dishes, four kidney dishes, two for the morning, one each, and then two for the evening. Both boys are, are unable to swallow tablets, and especially those slow-release tablets. And in the past we've had to grind them up in a mortise and pestle and, and then try and scrape them into a little syringe and then add a little bit of water. And, we uh, do feel like chemists feel like in chemists. a way. We feel like a, a nurse, we feel like a doctor, or, you know. <laughs> when I was 14, I started noticing some problems. I wasn't hearing my friends right. So my GP recommended that we 
undergo an MRI to understand and see what was wrong. I had neurofibromatosis type 2 and it was showing that I had tumours on both my hearing nerves, on my left and right hearing nerve. I was referred to an ENT specialist who recommended that we remove the tumour on the left hand side because of the size it was at at the time. So that left me with no hearing in that ear. About five years after I was officially diagnosed with neurofibromatosis type 2, we were doing our regular annual MRI and 12 tumours appeared on my spinal nerve. I was on the trial for Avastin for a period of just over two years. It was infused in the same way as chemotherapy. It really helped because it gave me two, just over two years, like with my hearing, to do everything that I needed to do. Like, you know, I needed to finish my degree at uni. I was, I still had a job that required, you know, a lot of hearing. So it was a fantastic treatment, yeah. I got Crohn's disease when I was 14. So I've lived with it for the last 20 odd years. I got very sick about three times, ended up in hospital for a long time. I was housebound for about a year each time. Well now I've had enemas and suppositories, numerous colonoscopies, too many things up a man's behind can start to mess with his peace of mind. I tried acupuncture once, I didn't understand the fuss. The only comfort that I found was when he took the needles out on the advice of a rapper called Dr. Dre. I smoked marijuana every day. I knew he wasn't a real doctor, but I was open-minded. Hey, hey, healthcare, healthcare, believe me, I've been there. I didn't take medicine, it took me. Healthcare, healthcare, I've had more than my fair share till I finally had my surgery. The thing about Crohn's is a very resistant illness, so it, um, Every time you try a new medication, the Crohn seems to figure out a way of resisting it and coming back stronger, and then that medication doesn't work anymore. So I've been on some really severe combinations of antibiotics, very expensive, non-PBS medications, lots of side effects. You know, I, I, I've been through periods where for two years I was getting up in the morning and taking 13 different pills and trying to remember what combinations I'd taken, and they all had weird interactions. And, it was a very difficult thing for a long time, but I, I, at least I can say that I tried absolutely everything available. At the end of 2012, I decided to follow my gastro's advice and actually have surgery and have the whole troublesome organ removed. And since then I'm disease-free, medicine-free, and I've just become a dad as well. About two years ago, uh, I was diagnosed um, with type two diabetes after going to my GP and um, feeling pretty unwell. She ran some, some general tests and, and found out I had the type 2 diabetes. But because we had been trying for a baby and that was not happening, um, I was then put in um, un, sort of under the areas of an endocrinologist. She had basically looked at me and said, look, I don't think you're a type 2, I think you're what we call a type 1 and a half, which means I have the antibodies of a type 1, which means insulin for the rest of my life. Normally you get type 1 as a child, but I actually have it have had it as an adult. I thought it was type 2 because I, ha I was actually carrying weight at the time so I did actually lose 20 kilos. Usually you're diagnosed with type 2 later in life like say when you're in your 50s and 60s and that's usually a, a lifestyle disease with your type 2 but they flag they, that's another flag that came up and they said oh you're too young to have type 2 and that's also why they said well I think we might have type 1. It did concern me a bit because that's just showing that it's not being picked up. I definitely think um, yeah, GPs need to have more education on type one and a half. They obviously know what type one is and they know what type two is, but I think in diagnosing it um, first, um, I think, yeah, more education is needed there. I found out about this when I was about 19. I suddenly developed the ability to sleep for a really long time, which had never been something I'd had before. I went to the endocrinologist and they diagnosed me with um, hypothyroidism, which is an autoimmune disease. That was a big, big relief to know what was going on and that it wasn't being a crazy 19 year old that was going out too much as my mum 
kind of hinted at. <laughs> so once I was diagnosed, I was put on a regime of um, medications. What you do is you take a synthetic form of the hormone that your body can't create, which is thyroxine. So I take that every day. Once it's stabilized, it's pretty straightforward. You take your medication every day. You will do so for the rest of your life. So I'm 35 weeks pregnant at the moment and having hypothyroidism actually increases your chance of miscarriage to 50% in the first eight weeks. So for me, getting pregnant was a pretty big deal. My husband is a, a junior doctor. He didn't tell me what the rate of miscarriage was. He just said it was increased. If you have low thyroid function and you get pregnant, your baby's IQ can be really severely affected. So it's better to have a planned pregnancy if that's possible. There was a lot of um, endocrinology appointments and blood tests and things leading up to it that meant that we could get the all clear. When I found out that I had diabetes, I guess the first thing that I thought of was, well, there's people who are worse off, it's manageable, it's not a big deal, couldn't work out why everyone else around me was crying. I was luckily young enough to just get on with it. I've known it in my life longer than I haven't known it, so it's just part of my thought process, my everyday routine. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you do your blood sugar, you take insulin. That's kind of what it is to me. The way that you can manage and adjust the medicines to suit your lifestyle has changed a lot since I was diagnosed to where I am now. Um, which I think I've found some health professionals aren't in the newer thinking of using these medicines in the right way that they're meant to be used. There's not always the right understanding with all health professionals and the way that diabetes, especially type 1, is now managed with medicine and the individual. Some doctors can't understand that you can adjust it yourself and you can move it around to suit what you need to do at that time. Whooping cough is a very contagious disease and very complex to control. But whooping cough isn't just a cough. It releases a toxin that can cause pneumonia, it can cause um, you know, the child, your child just coughs uncontrollably till they cannot breathe and they just stop breathing. So in Dana's case, she escalated very quickly, um, not being able to breathe, having coughing fits every three, few minutes and stopping breathing. Um, when she was then intubated and put on a ventilator. Um, and then unfortunately, she was the one in 200 that developed rapid invasive pertussis where it attacked all of her organs. Not only were we not aware of whooping cough, neither was our GP and we were in fact sent home three or four times until she was tested and she was only tested because I kept going back. I was told she just had a cold um, and I was told she was, wasn't hospital material and five days later she was dead. The problem is that you can't protect your child from something that you don't know about. We were not warned, we were given no warning, not told about whooping cough and not told we needed a booster. The biggest issue is that no one's telling new parents that they need a booster to protect their child because immunity from the vaccine and the disease wanes. I must admit I'm quite excited about the e-health record, um, particularly when you have little fellas that are in and out of hospitals and have um, lots of doctors on board that when we go to the hospital or should we not be with the boys when they need to go to hospital that that record is there. I can see a future where medicines cure everything. I mean if you look at where medicines come in the last hundred years you know we, we've made huge advances and science is, is going to keep breaking down these frontiers. My idea is that if I can keep myself healthy now you don't know what advances are going to be in medicine in the next 20 years which means that you might be that candidate to have that transplant or that trial of medication or that, that new insulin, that new procedure done. People need to know about whooping cough. They need to know they need a booster. And the medical industry needs to understand the symptoms so they can diagnose it quickly. In the beginning, I was very against taking medication. I now accept that that's the way I have to live my life. To, to say that I've reconciled what I, how, what I take, how I take it, why I take it in my heart and in my soul would be right. I'm sort of caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment, between having an idea of what this disease is going to end up like uh, versus time frames of what the medication can potentially do. I don't know which evil's worse. If they could really focus on reducing some of the side effects, 
that would be one thing that I'd definitely be uh, hoping for. It is unknown whether my pancreas will completely give out. Is there some way if, if we can find out in the future if I'm going to need more insulin? I sort of would like to know because maybe I can get myself ready for that. Promoting the need to have a regular um, a regular health checkup, even if you're a young person, would be a good thing. If I hadn't been um, picked up by going to donate blood, it might have taken me another two years before I went to be diagnosed or have the tests that I needed just because of being a teenager and, and kind of not having that health awareness.